And the progression to uh, myeloid fibrosis or acute myeloid is not seen very often, but it is seen, and obviously it's a, it's a very important problem because that means the shorter life expectancy. Briefly, in terms of management of progression, we all agree bone marrow biopsy, right? And and then what happens then uh, when you have a case of elevated blast or fibrosis with progression in the cytopenias or or a big spleen? How do we go about management of post-ET MA for AML? Is there any specific difference than otherwise? No, I think the management of post-ET MF would be similar to that of primary MF or post-PV MF. I think you're still looking primarily at spleen and symptoms as you make a decision for ruxolitinib, for example, or as you make a decision for an anemia-directed therapy. Again, you're, you're really looking at, uh, at the at the, at the picture uh, you know, of the whole patient who can have not just one uh, thing, but you try to choose the predominant problem as Rami alluded to earlier during his talk to try and manage. So I think it's either anemia directed therapy or spleen and symptoms directed therapy, which of course tends to be ruxolitinib. Uh, but of course the prognosis changes in a significant way. And I usually have that discussion with the patient uh, when it is post TTMF. Um, AML, of course, is, is, is a whole different, uh, you know, cup of tea and uh, there, uh, uh, you know, uh, when, when the blasts are increasing, you're getting into accelerated phase, even before the formal post-MF, uh, 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 post-ET uh, uh, AML, you want to introduce the hypomethylating agents, for example. I think those are the cornerstone right there uh, for, for those patients, while perhaps continuing ruxolitinib if indicated for spleen symptoms, etc. Now, we'll conclude with the last question. The Andrew briefly was talking about when you change to myeloid fibrosis, then you manage uh, basically like any other myeloid fibrosis patients looking at the symptoms, the spleen, anemia, you may include the therapy with JAK inhibitors. Is there a role for JAK inhibitors in ET? I know there were some studies and it's not officially approved, but is there a role or possible path forward for development? What's your feeling about it? Yeah, I think that, that it's less clear, obviously, than, than with polycythemia vera and with, with mild fibrosis, and, and probably because ET is just a little bit lower on the spectrum as far as uh, the symptom burden. There's less, in, there's less uh, incidence of, of, uh, of splenomegaly. There's uh, less need to control the hematocrit. So the things that, that uh, you know, ruxolitinib has been shown to do effectively aren't present as frequently in those ET patients. But that doesn't mean that none of those things are present in every ET patient. And, and certainly there are some ET patients that have a significant uh, constitutional symptoms and splenomegaly. And, um, and it, especially even in the JAK2 mutant ET patients, they may have you know, uh, hemoglobins that are getting close to that uh, that would be you know, considered to be polycythemia vera. And so I think there are a subset of patients that could certainly benefit from ruxolitinib because we know that it's a very good drug in controlling symptoms, reducing spleen size, and controlling hematocrit. And while the majority of ET patients don't need all of those things done, some do. Really nice uh, discussion. Thank you all very much for review of ET. Uh, thank you again. We will move on to the next case.